Well, hello everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today on your faculty, staff and students at University of Toronto and different universities around the world and across Canada. Uh, thank you so much for being here. My name is Moji and on behalf of our team at IEEE U of D, I would like to welcome you to the Quantum Artificial Intelligence Talks, QAI Talks hosted by IEEE U of D. We are very happy to have you here with us today. Um, we were surprised by the overwhelming number of students that were interested in the quantum artificial intelligence. Um, right now, we've passed over 270 registrations for this brand new event. And we are fortunately are limited about uh, 300 uh, people for this event. So we do have to uh, shorten the amount of registrations. Um, today's event wouldn't have been possible without the generous help of our speakers and networking partners. And we are really happy that today we're bringing together a community of industry leading experts and passionate students. Although this event is online, we would like to acknowledge the land on which University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it's been the traditional land of here in Vendette, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we're grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. And now I would like to pass it on to the chair of IEEE, Gaurav Ranganath. Gaurav? Hey everyone, my name is Gaurav and I'm the branch chair of IEEE U of T. Uh, welcome to QAI. IEEE stands for the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers. IEEE is one of the world's largest professional associations that develops, defines, and reviews electronics and computer science standards. Its mission is to foster technological innovation and excellence for the benefit of humanity. As a student branch, we host workshops, networking events, and hackathons to help students pursuing careers in electrical and computer engineering reach their professional goals. I know the team's been working really hard in this event, so I hope you have fun and learn a lot. Awesome, thank you, Garv. Um, before we begin, I want to thank our wonderful speakers and networking groups. They've taken time out of their busy schedule to be with us at this event. Um, without them, there's no doubt this event would have not been possible. So thank you all. Um, also, I want to thank the other associates on my team, um, which you do not see at the camera at this moment, uh, but who have been working very hard over the past couple of months to put together this event. Isha Sharma, Hemanish Jindal, and Akinori Kimura. Uh, they've been working really hard over the past couple of months and we really hope that you'll be excited about this seminar and you enjoy it as much as we did planning it. Quantum AI is an interdisciplinary field of quantum computing and artificial intelligence. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with artificial intelligence and machine learning, but what exactly is quantum computing? Uh, perhaps to answer that, it's better to ask what quantum computers are and how they're different than our everyday classical computers. Quantum computers rely on the laws of quantum mechanics to encode information. In a classical computer that you're probably watching this seminar from right now, the information is encoded in bits, that is zeros and ones. And you could have multiple bits to represent strings of zeros and ones. But quantum computers encode information very differently. They encode information on what is called qubits or quantum bits. And the information stored is no longer a binary, so it's not a zero or one, and each qubit can actually be at a state of zero and one at the same time, what physicists call the superposition of states. Uh, this new way of storing information is what has made uh, quantum computers at an immense computational power. Now, this computational power can en enable many new great things, and for one, can be used to speed up AI and machine learning algorithms that are already applied to different fields such as finance and trading, pharmaceutical drug discoveries, and cryptography. Now, I want to share with you our schedule today. Um, as you can see, uh, we're just at the opening ceremony. We started about a couple of minutes late, uh, but don't worry, we're going to catch up. Everything's going to be okay. Uh, for our first speaker, we also have Professor Nathan Yip with us, uh, which we're going to introduce him in about a minute. If you guys want to access today's schedule, along with all, all the other information about our wonderful speakers and wonderful uh, networking guests that are joining us today, we've sent you an email through Eventbrite with the links uh, to a PDF file that you can access all of those information there. So make sure to check that out. And if you do have any questions uh, during the seminar, try um, sending a message to any of our organizers. And if you can't uh, 
messages, just send us an email at qaitalks at ieee.utrono.ca. Now, uh, to overall show you our speaker series, um, we have six amazing uh, speakers joining us today. And uh, we, uh, we're gonna be hearing from different, a different range of topics, which, is, which I'm sure you're gonna like. And we're gonna actually introduce every one of our speakers right before their talk, but just wanted to show you the speakers uh, in a nutshell. And for the networking sessions, um, these are the different organizations, companies, and school uh, student groups that are joining us today at the event. Um, there will be breakout rooms set up for you guys at the end of the talks, which would be at about 5.15. You would be able to join in and talk with the different groups uh, as you're interested in. Now, to start with uh, introducing our networking, or, uh, ne networking guests, I would like to introduce you to John Donahue and Caitlin McDonald, who are joining us from uh, University of Waterloo DIQC department. Uh, Caitlin is the, gra uh, the Graduate School Program Coordinator and also the Crypto, War uh, Crypto Works 21 Coordinator. And John is currently uh, the Scientific Outreach Manager at the Institute for Quantum Computing. And he oversees the USQIP program, which is the Undergraduate School for Experimental Quantum Information Processing. It's one of those cool summer programs that you could probably apply to and if you're interested. There are also tons of other programs and uh, different options that you, that you can have. You can talk to them for sure uh, during the networking session. Next, we have Alba and uh, Tiha. Uh, I apologize if I'm uh, mispronouncing the names. Uh, doc, uh, Dr. Tiha and Alba are joining us. Uh, they're both uh, postdoc students and they're joining us from the MATLAB group. Um, and their focus is on, on quantum computing and uh, Dr. Tiha is actually focusing on quantum computing, quantum sim simulation, and all sorts of things. And Alba is also working on quantum algorithms. And she's one of the key hosts for the Quantum Research Seminar Toronto. Next, we have Mark Fingerhoof and Michael Steckley. Um, Mark is currently um, at the Protein Cure, and he's the head of research and development there. And he, he also co-founded Protein Cure which focuses on some pharmaceutical drug discoveries. And they're both part of the Quantum Open Source Foundation team. They have wonderful uh, mentorship programs, and there are a lot of uh, different resources that you can uh, learn about quantum computing on their website. Uh, Michael is also currently a quantum software engineer at Zapata Computing. He is part of the QSF team, and he's one of the other hosts for the Quantum Research Seminars Toronto. And these are the three student groups that are joining us today at the University of Toronto Machine, uh, Machine Intelligence Student Group, uh, University of Toronto Quantum Computing Club, and U of T AI. Um, if you're interested in, uh, in the topics that are going to be discussed today, they have a range of different uh, programs that you can join in, or uh, some sort of like course programs throughout the year. Definitely also go ahead and talk with them. We have Tanisha Bassan joining us. Uh, Tanisha is currently a physics student at the University of Toronto. She's previously interned at Zapata Computing. If you're a first or second year student, you have not, uh, don't have the experience with the internship in the past, you should definitely talk to her and get her insight on that. She joined Zapata Computing before uh, she even started uh, university. And we also have Spencer Churchill here with us today. He's an Kiskit advocate and a junior student, uh, junior studying computer science. If you're interested about learning cloud quantum computing, um, make sure to talk to Spencer in the networking session. To make the uh, make this seminar a bit more interactive, we'll be using uh, Slido. Uh, with Slido, you guys can go ahead and actually ask your questions, and you can upload the questions that you like. Um, so if you go ahead and go onto this link right here, app.sly.o.do. You can go ahead and uh, click the code that we're gonna give for each of the speakers. And you can go there, write down the questions that you like. And at the end of the 10 minutes that we've given to our speakers, you could ask them the questions. Um, we will be moderating the questions that you have asked throughout their talk. So again, please go to app.sly.do. Now, I'd like to introduce our, uh, our first speaker, Professor Nathan Biep. He has recently joined the Department of Computer Science at the University of Toronto as an assistant professor. He's also a researcher in quantum computing and focuses on quantum methods for machine learning and simulation of physical systems. 
He has received his PhD in 2011 from University of Calgary, studying quantum computing before accepting a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Waterloo, and finally joining Microsoft Research in 2013. In 2019, he left Microsoft to accept a joint appointment at the University of Washington and Pacific North, uh, Northwest National Labs. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Dr. Nathan Viet. Great, thank you very much, everybody. Let me share my screen and uh, get the whole thing started. So one of the things is, it's really great to be back uh, back in Ontario after all of these years. I, I had an amazing time out here when I was a postdoc in, in Waterloo and it's uh, it's been a lot of fun. I just wish that, you know, COVID hasn't, uh, hadn't gotten in the way of everything. Also, we've got a great list of uh, speakers today. And in particular, I'd like to bring everybody's attention to Maria Schold who'll be speaking uh, after me. Maria's pioneered. Uh, a lot of work in quantum machine learning. And uh, uh, Archie talks are kind of going to go, I think, uh, hopefully at least, uh, are going to feed into each other pretty naturally. One of the things that I, I want, the thing, main thing that I wanted to talk about today is I really wanted to kind of prime you with um, a, a key idea that I think is uh, really important for everybody in machine learning, which is that the quantum machine learning is really at such a new field that we have no idea what we're doing yet. Uh, and that so may sound like a daunting thing, but to me, it's a tremendous opportunity because there's a lot of subtleties that end up showing up in the study of quantum machine learning that have actually helped me not only come up with a deeper under, uh, appreciation for what it means to learn inside a quantum regime, but have also helped me personally understand, uh, have a better context about how classical machine learning works. So today, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be talking about some of these questions that ideally I'd like you to be able to learn uh, or learn to ask yourself when approaching quantum machine learning. And also, I'd like to be able to show some of the opportunities as well as some of the restrictions that quantum technologies face when trying to solve learning problems. So at a high level, really, what is machine learning? Now, machine learning is now a horribly overloaded phrase. Um, basically, what machine learning more or less ends up meaning, it's the study of particular algorithms where the specification of the algorithm isn't specifically or directly given to the computer. Instead, the computer learns how to classify or how to act, uh, basically how to make decisions based on examples that are provided to it by, by uh, humans or exp uh, experience that it's had. So that's basically the whole idea of machine learning. And so to give you an ex example of you know, such a, a problem, right? Let's take a look at this a cat classifier that we'd like to build, okay? So here are two images that we're put in. And we'd like to be able to determine you know, which is the real cat and which is the fake cat. Now, obviously looking at this for like two seconds, I'm pretty sure all of you are capable of realizing which one's the real cat and which one's uh, the not so real cat. Although the, the cat I chose is looking, you know, particularly weird. Um, it, I assure you it nonetheless is a cat. The um, key thing about, uh, about this is that I can tell you right off the bat that that image on the left is a cat. But why is it that I, I know it's a cat? How could I formally reason to you, if you didn't know what the concept of a cat was, that that image on the left is a cat and the one on the right is a toddler masquerading as a cat? Well, in part, this, is, this uh, indicates that to some extent, humans, when we, when we make decisions about the things we see in the, our everyday life, we have a lot of features that are similar to machine learned models. We often don't have explicit rules that we set up in order to be able to uh, allow us to convey how we make a decision about catness in this particular case. Um, but the thing is, is that uh, despite that, we can be highly proficient at this. And machine learning follows the exact same sort of path. The key idea behind, behind this, and I think this is most typified by um, deep networks, is that the whole idea behind uh, a deep learning, which has taken machine learning by storm, 
is that deep learning tries to build a hierarchical representation for the data. And it tries to model this concept of cat or not cat in this particular case by learning abstract features. And so this is a diagram of a, what's known as a deep neural network. And so in a feed forward version of, the, of, a, of a deep neural network, the raw images would be fed in on the left-hand side of this diagram over here. And then that data would propagate through according to some very simple rules to the next layer of neurons and the next layers. Each layer you can end up seeing as representing um, the data at a different level of abstraction. So for example, you know, if we take a look at this, these images over here, if I were to try to convey to you why I think this is a cat uh, on the left and the image on the right is a toddler, then what I would do is I would come up with higher level uh, uh, features of the image to say, well, you know, the, one cat, the image on the left has whiskers whereas the one on the right clearly has whiskers painted on his little face. So the, the question is, right, okay, well, how do I articulate the notion then of what a whisker is if I wanted to get a computer to be able to replicate this? And this is the whole idea of what goes on in deep learning. Each of these layers you can think of as an automatically learned different layer of abstract features, like those whiskers that they're taking a look at. In this particular case of a neural network, uh, what happens actually is some of these neurons actually end up corresponding to uh, learning diagonal lines, for example. Others, for this particular case, correspond, you know, to because it was trained on facial data, correspond to faces. And this literally is an example of a filter that this uh, neural network ended up uh, learning in order to identify this, uh, this kind of ghostly image of a face. Um, and this one over here uh, was actually similarly a, a tabby looking cat node. By the way, I chose cats, um, and I apologize for people who heard me make this joke before, but I chose cats not because of a connection to Schrodinger's cat here, but because of the fact that actually cat identification is a very important problem for machine learning. In part, this is because most of our, our a lot of our image data that we end up using uh, ends up coming from clips from YouTube videos. And YouTube videos are disproportionately humans and cats. <laughs> so actually, many deep learning models work surprisingly well for humans and cats, but in many cases, less well for other images. So this is the whole idea of a deep learning network. And this concept of whether we're looking at a cat or not ultimately would be decided by the values of these two neurons at the end of the, uh, the network alone. We actually don't even care about these units in the middle. So just to give you a little bit of nomenclature that I'm going to use in this talk, the parts that you see is in like the input and the output layers of neurons at the end of the, the networks. We call these visible units because they're, they're the parts you see. All this stuff in between over here, these boxes that I've drawn, these are called hidden. The reason why is because of the fact that we don't actually directly make our decisions based on any of those values in there. Those are just used to generate more abstract concepts at the higher, at the more higher, or in this diagram, closer to the right side of the network. And so we can imagine that basically these are just used to store temporary data. And we throw all of this data out in the end and only make our decisions based on ultimately for the case of classification, these two uh, neurons in the end. So that's basically how uh, deep learning works. And that's the distinction between uh, visible and hidden units. And this idea of deep learning, it doesn't encapsulate all of machine learning. Is one thing I wanna make crystal clear to everybody. There's a lot of machine learning that's highly successful that is not deep learning. However, for some areas such as vision and speech, the, this approach has become so useful that it's more or less uh, dwarfed every other approach. The biggest problem about it is, of course, that these models, just like when I tried to, tried to you know, articulate why I thought the image on the left was a cat, they're very difficult to be able to convey why the network makes one decision versus another. So that's the downside. But basically, it's got this richness property to it where a whole host of very complex uh, distributions 
can be represented by these statistical models. So, okay, if that's machine learning, well, what is quantum machine learning? Quantum machine learning is basically the exact same idea, but instead of trying to be, use a classical mathematical model to be able to describe the correlations between the input data and the concepts that we want to use to classify the data, we represent that data using quantum states. Now those quantum states, they could be either uh, ordinary data that we've, we've got, you know, like for example, these images of the cat and a toddler. All of these in quantum machine learning, one approach uh, to do that would be to take, solve problems involving this type of a classification, take these particular images, convert them into quantum states and load them into a quantum computer for processing. Okay, and there's various advantages that we can end up getting through the use of ideas in, from um, uh, either quantum simulation or ideas from amplitude amplification and many other approaches. But the, um, also these sorts of approaches can be used in order to be able to actually try to tackle raw quantum data that's coming in. So the reason, what, probably the biggest reason why I'm fascinated about quantum machine learning is it gives us a way of quantifying or thinking about what learning ends up looking like in a quantum environment. And so the main aspirations behind this, uh, behind this field are first of all, to show computational speed ups. In many cases, it, 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 it is quite costly to build and train a highly accurate model that will end up uh, describing a data set and at the same time allow it to generalize. Because if we're building a model to detect, you know, a cat versus a uh, not cat in this case, and it works with 100% accuracy on the images that it's seen and never works on anything else, then that's not a very useful model. So in machine learning, what we always want to do is we want to be able to train our models to work very well in the data they've seen, but we also want to make sure that it generalizes beyond that. In some sense, we want to make sure that it's capable of learning the central concept behind the data that we've put into it. And so to this end, one of the main goals is actually to use the fact that with quantum computers, you have all of these non-local correlations that can uh, occur, such as entanglement, which potentially can give us ways uh, or can give the quantum computer ways of representing correlations between data uh, more effectively than you would get otherwise. And also, it can fundamentally lead to new ways of approaching and thinking about learning. And it's, of course, that latter uh, question that's the, the one that really fascinates me the most, I would say. And so the main thing that I'd like to get across with all of this is that we really, although it sounds like there's a direct link and a very obvious link between quantum and classical machine learning, I'd say that actually we're still as a community struggling to try to figure out how we should approach and how we should think about what the similarities and what the differences are between quantum and classical machine learning. And a number of the particular issues that come up when approaching this particular field that people need to think about are importantly, what's the classical analog of a QML algorithm? And this is really important because of the fact that in, pra in practice, machine learning is an empirical field. What we have to do is we have to be able to compare our method up against the best methods that are out there. But in order to do that properly, we have to make sure that that fight is fair. So we have to make sure that our data, we're providing our data in an appropriate way to both the classical and the quantum models that don't accidentally end up favoring the quantum or favoring the classical by giving the, the data in a form that's more easily accessible to one or the other. So we have to understand what we're doing when we're benchmarking them. The other thing that we need to do is we really need to consider all of the types of complexity for this. One of the big challenges that ends up happening with whenever you do anything on a quantum computer is measuring the quantum state ends up disturbing it. And so this means that every time we try to draw a sample from this or, or put, prepare our data in, we don't get an outcome necessarily with 100% probability. We get it with some fixed probability. And so in order to be able to make a judgment with high certainty to it, 
we often will need to repeat these quantum machine learning algorithms many, many times. Whereas often, at least what people often consider the classical analogs of these methods, we would only have to apply the algorithm once. And so this makes the question of figuring out how many operations are actually needed in order to solve the problem a lot more difficult and forces us to spend more time thinking about complexity. But this also opens up, because this is such a new field, questions about what the fundamental limitations are to uh, quantum learning. In particular, there are some con uh, concepts which might be learnable, but could take a prohibitive amount of resources to learn. And because we can rely on tools from quantum computing and quantum information theory that give us lower bounds, we can leverage these techniques in order to allow us to be able to figure out what, fun what the fundamental limits are that quantum mechanics ends up posing on our ability to learn. And the other challenge, of course, that we really need to think about in this space is that, as I said, most of machine learning is an empirical field. And so the question is, it, when performing benchmarks to figure out how well uh, particular algorithms work, how is it that we collect enough data and do large enough simulations that we can be convinced that the patterns we see will persist as we grow the system up, given that present day quantum computers are quite small. To give you an idea, the biggest quantum computers that we have at the moment are on the order of uh, 50 uh, to 100 quantum bits. That's it. And so, whereas if you take a look at the uh, deep models that are used in the classical realm, these, the deepest ones can have uh, millions of bits in them. And so this means that the scale of problems that we can tackle with quantum machine learning at the moment is really limited. And so getting an idea convincingly about how well these heuristics that people are developing at the moment will end up scaling is actually a major difficulty. And the final thing that I really kind of want to get across in this talk is that, you know, when coming up with a quantum um, uh, algorithm for doing machine learning, it's not sufficient to just take an existing algorithm and sprinkle some quantum on top of it and just cross your fingers and hope that that quantum algorithm is going to work better than the classical one. It, quantum effects are powerful and they have to be used surgically. And here we're going to, I'm going to show some examples of what can go wrong if you don't use quantum effects surgically when trying to do quantum machine learning. Okay, so first thing I'd like to do is I'd like to talk about how to, how to think about the input in uh, quantum machine learning algorithms. So the fundamental input that we end up thinking about is uh, typically we phrase it in terms of vectors. So an idea uh, uh, about this is let's envision we want to separate uh, two concept classes, the concept class of, you know, shown by blue dots and the concept class of orange dots down at the bottom. I've shown our data in such a way so that it's separable, so that it's possible to come up with a model which will unambiguously determine whether a dot is blue or a dot is orange. In the left-hand case, it's really easy. All you have to do is just take a look at this line that I've drawn here, that we, uh, is drawn here, and determine whether or not the dots are above or below the line. And from that, you can unambiguously determine, even if you didn't get to see the color of a dot, whether it should be classified as an orange or a blue dot. Now, with other, other uh, uh, types of data, they, they could be separable, but the separating uh, a line between them may not be straight. It could be curved. And this is what we call a, a nonlinear decision boundary. Now, in order to get some deeper understanding or some deeper uh, vision about this, the input vectors that we use to train our models often end up uh, coming in the form of uh, what we call supervised data. So in this particular case, what happens is we have a vector, which in this case would correspond to say the position of these individual dots and a label, which would correspond to the color. And the aim of a, quanta, of, a, of a quantum or classical machine learning algorithm would be effectively to learn this line that separates the blue concept from the orange concept, okay? And, or, and to find the position of that line only using these vectors and labels that are fed into it. Okay, so when we're quantizing ML, the very first thing we need to do is we need to represent all the data we're training the algorithm with as vectors. 
I should mention, just as a jargon thing, that all the components of these tra uh, training vectors are known as features. And so, well, this ends up giving us a very natural way of doing this in classical computing, is in, if I wanted to store this vector six and nine, or nine and four, I could end up just thinking about these as bit strings that I'm, I'm storing inside my classical computer. However, in a quantum computer, there's actually multiple natural ways that we can do this that aren't necessarily all just a bit representation. So the two main approaches that people within the field have used within the last few years are an approach known as bit encoding as well as amplitude encoding. And the idea behind bit encoding is very straightforward. What we do is we would take the, quant uh, the, the classical bits corresponding to the vectors and we just translate each of those classical bits directly over to a quantum bit, all right? So it's really nice because actually with this, with this approach, we have all of the power uh, that classical machine learning would have and some extra. We have the extra leverage that quantum mechanics ends up giving us. However, one of the problems, as I said before, is that the largest scale problems that we're taking a look at can be huge. So to give you an idea, a standard uh, example that's often used to benchmark machine learning algorithms is handwriting recognition. And ha handwriting recognition, you know, a standard task is to take a look at this repository known as MNIST, where what we would want to do is we want to say, look at a four and be able to determine this. This image four is fed in by taking a look at the pixel values. And the pixel values are then loaded into the quantum computer. If we assume that only one bit is used for each pixel, then we'd need a 784 bit or quantum bit quantum computer to do this. And that is, you know, between, between um, seven to 15, depending on, you know, roughly speaking where you think we are um, in, in quantum computing uh, computers times the, the largest uh, quantum computer that's been built right now. So even the simple problem of handwriting recognition can't be solved exactly without downscaling the image. And so for that reason, people tend not to use this approach because we just don't have quantum computers to be able, that are big enough to directly load the data over. This leads to another approach, which is amplitude encoding. So the idea basically is that a quantum state can be in a superposition of different configurations at the same time. So basically, you know, a general quantum state over here can be written in the form sum over j equals one to two to the n, uh, a j, j, okay? Where this j, what this means is this means a configuration. And n here, this is the number of bits, number of quantum bits, I should say, that we use to describe the system. So with a small number of quantum bits like n, this ends up meaning that we can represent two to the n components in this larger vector. So what amplitude encoding says is, hey, why bother sticking with n to represent the bits? Why not, or the data? Why not store the data in these amplitudes, these AJs? Because n quantum bits ends up going to two to the n a sub j. And this seems awesome because of the fact that your distribution now, you've got the ability to store exponentially more numbers using the same amount of memory. However, you know, despite that incredible compression, it is actually um, much more difficult to manipulate this type of quantum information. It's much more difficult to encode it. And the comparison between quantum machine learning uh, algorithms that use this encoding and the cl their classical brethren is actually much more subtle. And so to give you an idea about how one of these encodings would work, let's say what I do is I take a look at this guy right up here, okay? And I, that I just eyeballing that, I said that, that that vector is roughly at position two and four, okay? So I've taken the binary encoding of these particular values down here. This is two and four in binary. Um, so the, if we wanted to represent this on a quantum computer using a bit encoding, we actually would just get the binary versions of two and four, which are here and here respectively, and load them into a quantum state. Okay, so now our qubits are in the exact same uh, states corresponding to the bits in the original one. All right, it's that simple. 
Now, with an amplitude encoding, the simplest naive way that we could do this would be to take those coordinates, two and four, and, you, and load them in as quantum amplitudes over here. Now, a quantum state vector has a really curious property. If I have a quantum state that's in a mixture of zero and one at the same time, then what has to happen is that the, or what these amplitudes correspond to is each of these is like the square root of the probability of zero. And this one's like the square root of the probability of one. Okay, so what that means is that means that because the probability has to add up to one, this thing's norm has to be equal to one. So therefore, quantum state vectors are always unit vectors just because of the fact that the probability has to add up to one. So what happens with an amplitude encoding is we would take this vector two, four, and if we wanted to represent it directly on a quantum computer, we would represent that as a unit vector that's proportional to it. So let me show you what this would end up looking like. So in this particular case, what I've done is I've drawn a arc of the unit circle up here, and I'm taking a look at these two in, uh, instances in particular, right? Going to an amplitude encoding basically converts each of these directly to a unit vector. So this conversion to a unit vector would cause each of them to be mapped to here and there accordingly. Okay, so it looks like it's basically about the same, but one of the things that you'll note is that this decision boundary over here isn't a ray that's starting, it can't be viewed as a ray that's starting out from the origin, going out here. So this boundary, when we try to translate it back to the unit circle, no longer actually becomes a nice radial separation between the two classes. And in particular, what ends up happening is that when we end up doing this, we end up finding that actually for these vectors that are kind of brought back to the unit circle over here, the inner products aren't maintained and the data isn't necessarily separable anymore. So, and what I mean by separable here is that by a computer can unambiguously determine whether or not the data is in the red class or the green class by determining if it's uh, on which side of this line it's at. And when we compress everything down to unit vectors, we lose some of that information. And so this actually, there's some nerdy ways that we can, we can deal with this. It turns out that we can address this issue of the length of the vector um, by building it in a higher dimensional space, by padding the vector with a logarithmically large number of zero vectors. So I won't go into too much detail. There's a subtlety about it because it actually turns out that the transpose conjugate of each vector has to be encoded differently using this approach. But the moral of the story is, is that you can, you can do something that is uh, a lot less crude than this approach. We can choose these vectors to be in a higher dimension such that if there's an exact mapping, it loses no information between the vectors and the quantum states that represent it. So that's the key idea um, behind, behind this. Um, I should also mention that, interestingly enough, the classical analog of, am of an amplitude encoded vector is not the bit vector, curiously enough. Instead, what we can, uh, and you can see this because of the fact that, let's say what I did is I gave you this vector or copies of this vector coming in. And what we'd like to be able to do is we'd like to be able to um, regenerate the data that it came from. So for example, let's say that I had you know, an image that looked like four. I turn this into a quantum state. And this quantum state psi, if I measure the quantum state psi, what will happen with that measurement is I'll end up getting actually just a single pixel ID. Now the probability of getting that pixel will be higher on the four, but it's still just a probability. So if I wanted to be able to learn what the image is precisely, I would have to actually get many, many copies of this. And in general, without further promises, in order to go from copies of this to the bit image that generated it, I would actually need to measure this an infinite number of times. So what this ends up meaning is that Actually, in some senses, this amplitude encoded representation of four, for example, 
is actually less powerful than the classical bit encoded version. So what this ends up showing you is that depending on how you feed in the data to a, a quantum machine learning algorithm, in some cases, you can end up finding actually that the quantum version of it is actually exponentially worse than the classical version of it, just because of the fact that you haven't given the classical algorithm as difficult data. For example, the classical algorithm might have just the entire bit representation of this vector, which if you wanted to learn that from these quantum states, you'd have to repeatedly measure that an infinite number of times. So in that case, yeah, quantum actually uh, can sometimes be surprisingly less powerful. But the other thing that I wanted to mention is that there's also some surprising theoretical limitations to what we can do um, from, for amplitude encoding. So let me show you an example where we can prove actually that um, uh, amplitude encoding, uh, encoded versions of this will require actually an exponentially large number of measurements in order to be able to distinguish between two concept classes that could easily be distinguished using an ordinary computer. So the idea basically is imagine what you're trying to do is you're trying to solve a simple problem that determine whether a number is even or uh, has e a even parity or odd parity. So in particular, what I mean is I mean by, by that, does it have an even number of zeros or does it have a, uh, an even number of ones or an odd number of ones? In it. And so the basic way that we, we um, um, could, could do this is, you know, we can obviously just build a classical circuit that goes through and, you know, computes the parity and makes a decision based on that. So there's an efficient way of deciding whether a string is even or odd. But let's take a look at deciding that from, based on the, the data being fed in through an amplitude encoding. So here's an example of, of this. Let's say what I did is I wanted to feed in the uh, integer 101101. If I used an amplitude encoding, basically you could end up viewing that as a uniform quantum superposition over every location where the input bit string is one. So everywhere where there's a, a bit string one, we have the corresponding configuration on the quantum side active with equal probability. Now let's consider flipping one of the bits over here. Um, and I, I'll say, uh, let's flip this one. So now, whereas the top one was skipping five, the bottom one over here isn't. And so now the question is, what's the difference between these two vectors? Well, in this particular case, the, different, the inner product between them, which kind of measures the degree of similarity between these two vectors, ends up uh, be, going, being like two thirds which isn't all that bad, really, everything considered. But the problem is it ends up getting worse as you start going to higher dimensions. And this inner product ends up shrinking basically exponentially with the number of bits that you end up taking a look at. And this is really important because what it says is it says that if we've got two quantum states, one is uh, the odd concept, uh, like this, uh, oh, uh, for example, uh, this one down here is odd. And this example up here is an even bit string. The gap between these two for high dimensional spaces is going to scale like two to the minus n. It turns out the number of samples that we need in order to be able to distinguish between two quantum states ends up scaling like the distance between the two, uh, the two vectors in question. So what that ends up meaning is that basically, although the classical approach could have in a single try told the difference between an even and odd parity string, in this case, we're going to need to measure even with the best measurement possible an exponential number of times before we can decide with high probability whether the string is odd or even. So this shows that yeah, even though this is quantum, in some ways, unless we're careful about it, our quantum approach to this may require exponentially many measurements in order to be able to just get out the answer. And so this is an indication that we need to think very carefully about how we approach quantum machine learning and how we represent our data in this.
So um, Professor V, I'm sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to um, point out the time and uh, there are also yeah. uh, three, four right. questions. So let, me, let me kind of speed up then a little okay. bit. The next thing that I wanted to uh, kind of uh, get at over here is, okay, well, what about training these, uh, uh, these systems? So this is an example of a uh, unitary quantum neural network, coincidentally actually from a paper that Marie and I had together many, many moons ago. Um, but in any case, one of the things that we end up finding actually from studying these quantum neural networks is that generically the gradients that we end up seeing for the parameters of the neural network is in like if we try to train it in order to be able to find the best mo uh, model for the data, those gradients are exponentially small, meaning that they'll typically need exponentially many training steps to be able to actually learn a good model for the data. And so this has been known for a while and there's been some proposals to get around it. But my collaborators and I have actually noticed something kind of neat, which is that entanglement itself actually in uh, deep quantum deep networks can pose a critical danger to the power of quantum neural networks. In particular, if we have uh, a strong entanglement between the visible and hidden units in, uh, in a layer, uh, in a quantum uh, neural network, what that ends up meaning is that there's strong quantum correlations. And in fact, if a state is maximally entangled between the two, what that ends up meaning is that the quantum, in, the information that describes the system can't be localized either in the visible part of the network or the hidden part of the network. So if we try to throw away the hidden part of the network, which is what we would normally do with machine, uh, with deep learning, then actually throw away with high probability almost all of the data that we wanted to, that we needed in order to make our classification. And so this actually ends up uh, showing that entanglement can be a hindrance. And we prove that with a volume law, if you've got a volume law scaling, which is typical for complex quantum states in high dimensional spaces, that actually this is, this is typical. And entanglement generically actually will end up killing your ability to classify. Now, the, the question is, well, how can you, how can we get around this? How can we get, you know, kind of unlost in Hilbert space? And there's a couple of ways we can do this. The first way is that we can use prior information to get closer to our target. So if we know something about the model weights uh, that we want to use in order to be able to describe our data, we can do that. Um, the other thing we can do is switch to a better training objective function that doesn't suffer that problem that I was showing over there. And so one of the things that we've found actually very recently is that the, we can find a way of getting around this problem by choosing a, a derivative function that actually diverges near, or sorry, a distance function that diverges near zero. That ends up causing these exponentially small gradients to become amplified and allows us to solve this particular problem. Uh, the way we do this is basically we end up uh, switching from the standard objective function to a generative objective function and try to begin by training our neural network to generate examples of the training data that it had to begin with and use that to get close to the result. So uh, I won't bore you with the technical details about how we do this. Basically what we do is we uh, optimize a Rainy 2 divergence, which uh, is an upper bound on the relative quantum relative entropy, which is kind of like the distance between the quantum uh, two quantum distributions. Um, the nice thing about it is we can find a convenient expression for the gradient, and even we can actually numerically train this. So this is an example of um, a learning a random thermal state with the type of neural network that I was arguing uh, was problematic uh, to begin with using this generative pre-training strategy. And it gets around all the pro any, all problems that we've noticed about these vanishing gradients just because of the fact that it uses um, this generative pre-training step to kind of help it get closer to the answer to begin with. And so this is an indication that, you know, by understanding what can go wrong with quantum machine learning algorithms and what quantum machine learning algorithms really are saying, it helps us understand what are the right questions to ask of it and how to help the network end up getting into the, the region where training is easy versus kind of the generic case where training tends to be hard. So to conclude, when approaching quant quantum machine learning is, is a really fascinating field that offers to, to give a poten uh, potential advantages for a host of uh, problems of deep societal importance at the moment. 
but it's still a very new field. And we need to think very carefully about what the correspondence between classical and quantum machine learning actually is. Um, amplitude encodings can allow us to do, deal with this in the short term, but they have to be well designed. And in particular, uh, entanglement also, as I showed before, can't just be used as a universal resource for things. If it isn't used surgically in the case of quantum neural networks, it can actually utterly destroy the ability of the network uh, to predict. And so this ends up showing that, yeah, while quantum neural networks offer a host of power, they also re reveal a, a bunch of un, uh, so far unanswered questions and a lot of open possibilities for us to really be able to study what it means for a quantum system to learn and how we can best leverage quantum effects in order to build entirely new classes of learners that are more powerful than anything that we know today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Via. Thank you very much. Uh, so now uh, we're actually going to move in, uh, move on to the uh, questions that uh, the participants asked uh, during the Q&A. And Aki is going to moderate your questions. Yeah, so we have some questions coming up in the uh, Slido. Uh, someone is asking, what are the prerequisites for starting to learn deep learning independently? Okay, deep learning these days independently is actually pretty straightforward to get in. There's a number of great tutorials that you can find, uh, find online. Uh, I'd also recommend taking a look at uh, PyTorch. It's a wonderful uh, Python-based library that you, can, that you can use to get started on machine learning without really having to write your own backpropagation algorithm and all the rest of the stuff that old geezers like myself used to have to do. Um, the next question we have is, can we qualitatively compare the efficiency of classical machine learning and quantum machine learning depending on the same amount of input data? Okay, so the first thing that, that has to be really clear is, you know, we can under some circumstances and in some models of learning. For example, you know, one of the things that we can do is that in the context of PAC learning, which is probably the best form, uh, formulated version of it, which stands for probably approximately correct, um, we can find that actually the uh, classical models and quantum models, it turns out, are, are, no, are no different in terms of their ability to predict. So the amount of data that they end up needing qualitatively to learn a concept is, is actually within a constant factor of each other. The big thing that can be different in those cases is the time complexity needed to do the training. That can have an exponential separation, even if the amount of data that you have to provide is uh, basically the same. However, if your data is provided in a quantum superposition of states, then you can use interference between the different inputs that could be fed into your quantum neural network to get an advantage. And this often led to many of the uh, square root improvements that were seen by myself and my collaborators in some of the earlier work in quantum machine learning. Thank you very much. Um, I think for the sake of uh, time constraint, we're gonna end with one more question. And the question is, depending on the data being processed, can we address qubits deficiencies through downsampling? This is the question. Yeah, I mean, some, we, you can to some extent, right? But the, the thing is, is that unlike uh, classical machine learning, we don't have scalable quantum computers at the moment. We have a fixed size. And, you know, no, no matter how much money we throw at a quantum computer at the moment, you know, you're not going to be able to easily go from 50 qubits to, you know, 200 or 1,000. Whereas if we want to do that with an ordinary computer, we can scale up ordinary computers to as big as we want, and it's just money and time is the issue. And so that, that ends up meaning that, yeah, it's, it's not always possible to be able to do this. Is there, out of curiosity, is there like a Moore's Law equivalent with quantum computers and their sizes? There's been actually a couple of Moore's Law equivalents. There's um, a Moore's Law version known, <laughs> known somewhat facetiously as uh, Rose's Law that's applied, been applied to quantum annealers for years. There's um, a double, approximate doubling that ends up happening every couple of years with superconducting qubits uh, these days. And, but, and historically, the decoherence times that superconducting qubits have uh, been experiencing have been increasing exponentially. Although that's kind of leveled out, just like Moore's Law. So perhaps that's the closest analog to Moore's Law we've got. I see. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you again for your presentation.
Uh, now I'll hand it over to Bochi. Awesome. Uh, thank you again, Dr. Ria. Uh, that was a very, um, very amazing pre presentation, I would say, covering different, uh, different range of topics that uh, we wanted to hear. Um, so next, um, we have, let me actually share my screen here. Okay. So for our next, next speakers, uh, we have uh, Dr. Maria Scholl. Uh, Maria is a quantum machine learning researcher pursuing right now her uh, postdoctoral study at the University of KwaZulu Natal. Um, I hope the pronunciation is right. Um, she's also a researcher at Xanadu Quantum, uh, quantum Technologies, a company that creates silicon quantum photonic chips that uh, power quantum computers and also develops open source tools for quantum computing, such as the Penny Lane. Um, her research is focused on how quantum information processing can improve and extend methods in machine learning. Uh, we have the Slido link here um, before, um, before we invite Maria up to the stage. We'll just give, uh, give you guys a, a second if you want to scan the QR code with your phone so that you could go ahead and ask your questions. And Maria is also, I know she's uh, seven hours ahead of us here in Toronto. Uh, so Maria, I'm going to pass it to you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much. Um, I'm not a postdoc anymore, but I just realized I probably haven't updated my LinkedIn profile in a hundred years, so that's uh, totally my fault. Sorry about that. No, no, no problem. Um, um, yeah, I haven't ever given a talk at um, 10 o'clock on a Saturday night, but uh, everything is a first. And as you can see, I've got a really big sunburn because I spent the entire day at the beach, but uh, no, I'm happy to be here. Let me share my screen. Um, it's wonderful to speak after Nathan out of two reasons. The first one is that he's a, a really good talker and he has already given you a very broad overview and also like the cautionary tale of quantum machine learning. And I'll now open another box, basically. I'll look into this box of, we were talking about comparison of things and uh, Nathan has shown there's like different things that you could want to do with quantum computing. And that is, for example, speeding up classical algorithms, but there's a whole nother branch and it's a very dominant branch at the moment in quantum machine learning where you use a quantum computation as a generically new model and you see what happens if we do that. So this is the box I'll open a bit more. The second reason why I'm happy to speak after Nathan is that um, he's not just a, a colleague, but he, um, so thousands of years back when I started my PhD, I wanted to do quantum machine learning, but the field didn't exist yet. And I was warned by everyone not to do it. And Nathan was actually one of the few, there were probably two or three researchers all over the world who were interested in this. And um, he was one of the first people I actually spoke to. I think I sent an email back then. So like, it's always a very special pleasure. Um, okay, cool. Let's begin. Um, just to say, I want to just introduce you into a couple of concepts of machine learning, because basically what I want to say in the talk is the following. If we replace neural networks or, or machine learning models with quantum computations, we get something that we can train like a neural network, but that looks mathematics wise, very much like a kernel method or support vector machine. Uh, and I just want to tell you what kind of the idea of neural network and support vector machine is so that I can compare them after that. And you also have a few slides on what actually the quantum computation itself looks like. I just basically want to get there where I can compare the maths and it will be all in pictures, don't worry. Oh, worry, I don't know <laughs> which one's better. Okay, cool. So machine learning as Nathan already introduced, but maybe now one step further, usually contains three components. You've got data, usually sampled from a distribution. That's how we mathematically model it. You've got a model or basically actually not a model, but a model family. Think of it as a hypothesis class or something, which could be a function class that depends on parameters. And the model in some sense um, uh, reproduces the type of data you get. So in this case, I have a supervised learning model where you put something in and you get something out. So like a classification task of the cats that Nathan was showing, but there are lots of other models that could generate data, so on and so forth. And thirdly, you've got a cost and the cost tells you how well is your model doing on an amount of data that you have. So in supervised learning, you could compare the labels your model predicts to like the labels that you really had in a subset of training data. Task of machine learning, Nathan also like mentioned very nicely, is use some subset of data samples to construct or find a model that minimizes cost on unseen data. And here there's two big things in machine learning that are important. There's an optimization part. So that means optimize over the model class, optimize the cost over the model class given some data. But what you actually want to achieve is generalization. You don't want to like solve an optimization problem. You actually want to, um, in the end, have a good performance on unseen data. And to study this scientifically is one of the most 
fascinating ideas in science because you have a very weird problem here. You want to like optimize something actually on data you've never seen. And how to quantify that, how to like practically implement that is like, is like really nice. Um, okay, cool. And then there were like, I'll put them as three stages. So in, in textbooks, you sometimes see it as like the three big parts or like three big stories of machine learning. The first one, everyone always starts with linear models. They're actually very useful still today to analyze things. And linear models is the same thing as regression. You guys know it from physics or from statistics. And the idea is your model, you assume your data is just a, a vector of numbers. And then your model consists of another vector of weights. And these are trainable parameters. And then you just take the inner product of the two. And if you look at the decision boundary, this also Nathan plotted before as well. So basically this is the place in your, in your data space where the model would um, quantify, would classify. So you ask the model, like, is it green or blue? And you say like, if the model's output value is larger than zero, it's green, otherwise it's blue. And that decision boundary is where zero, where the model is undecided. And these decision boundaries for linear models are really stupid, they're just, lines and you can't do very very interesting machine learning with it although the models are beautiful for mathematical analysis um, but the nice thing about it you get a convex optimization problem if you never heard of convex optimization problems it's just a really nice optimization problem which has a single global minimum and you know it's nice to handle it is though not absolutely trivial for big data sets so the moment so convex optimization you have to think of matrix inversion techniques and matrix inversion scales these algorithms stay, scale in kind of the uh, quadratic size of the number of data points. So big data, if you've got billions of data points, um, these methods are actually not as nice as, you know, uh, I, I was just uh, suggesting. Secondly, kernel methods, and these are the ones, so I'm totally obsessed with kernel methods at the moment, because these are the ones that um, machine, quantum machine learning models look very similar to mathematically. Let me just explain what they are. Think of a linear model, but instead of staying in your original space, you actually map your data first to a very, very high dimensional space. So maybe an infinite dimensional space. And you immediately think of maybe Hilbert spaces. Um, and then you take this like um, weight vector, which might not be an infinite dimensional ve weight vector. So this model is something that's just mathematically constructed. This doesn't really exist. You can't train infinite weights, right? Um, but so just for the sake of the argument what you get is in this really high dimensional space a linear model and everything is convex and nice in that high dimensional space and the beauty of kernel methods is it's a huge mathematical apparatus most of you might know them from support vector machines where sorry this looks like a bit like a monster but um where basically you can do all your computations in the original space and in this original data space you get really interesting decision boundaries they can be as flexible as you wish they are as powerful as neural networks in terms of the expressivity um, and you still get a convex optimization problem and the models all depend, and this is important for one of the last slides, they all depend on inner products of data mapped to this high dimensional space. And this inner product is called a kernel and you can understand it as a distance measure. So you measure distances in a very high dimensional space. In computations, you never measure these distance in a very high dimensional space. What you do, you have a, a proxy basically in the original data space. So some distance measure like a Gaussian distance or something between two data points, but mathematically they're mapped into really high dimensional uh, spaces. And then third one, there's deep learning. Deep learning, everyone always thinks this is just neural networks or deep neural networks, and that's absolutely not true. So the last couple of years of machine learning research have been extremely exciting and uh, new results every year and everything is moving all theories of like 100 years are totally shifting at the moment. And the reason is deep learning. What happens in deep learning, you've got very big data sets and you've got um, a type of model that's called a neural network, which is basically just a linear model where you put the nonlinearity outside of the linear model. And then you start stacking these little building blocks. And so you get these like graphical notation for these neural networks. So each, each of these dots that Nathan showed is just like one of these stack, stacked basis blocks, basic blocks. And so these models are highly trainable. So they're very, very efficiently trainable. That's actually the beauty of them. And they're very modular. They're very composable. That's the two things that make deep learning, deep learning in some sense. And then thirdly, you've got, um, so you've got now a really hard optimization problem, actually non-convex optimization. Um, also a little comment here, um, non-convex optimization in general is a, is an intractably hard problem. So like you can't guarantee that you find a solution in usually a non-convex optimization problem without like really serious assumptions. Um, but however, that doesn't stop neural networks from being really good at solving these problems. And this is a bit tricky for quantum computing, where we always think of, oh, can we speed up things? Here, we don't even have guarantees that the neural networks, like, you know, they do something really hard already. So it's very hard to actually argue with 
complexity theory in these settings of deep learning. Anyway, side note closed. Um, what's also very important about deep learning is basically hardware and software. So you know that deep learning is enabled by GPUs, by tensor processing units, by, by special purpose hardware, maybe one day by quantum computers, who knows? Um, and then we also have special purpose software that is designed to train these big models. And um, they are based on a principle called automatic differentiation. If someone has heard of backpropagation, that's the machine learning version of automatic differentiation. Anyways, and now very briefly about quantum computing, and I will also not go deep, I just want to give you a couple of pictures again, because afterwards I want to join these pictures in some sense. Um, and as you've heard from Nathan, so basically you've got like, um, usually quantum computing is based on uh, N subsystems, binary quantum subsystems called qubits. And then um, I will just work with matrix and vector representation. So quantum state for me is always represented by a vector. Uh, this vector is two to the n dimensional and this corresponds to this um, superposition that Nathan has written like the sum over like coefficients times configurations. What you see here is just a vector of the coefficients and the configurations is just a convention. We know that the first one corresponds to configuration zero, 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 zero and so on and so forth. And this law is again um, valid that the absolute square of this value is the probability of seeing this configuration in the qubits. And then quantum computing, we have, um, we consider basically physical operations on these systems um, as a circuit or an algorithm. And usually this is written, drawn in this way. And it's just a unitary, many of you will know this by now, but like this is just a unitary transformation. So it's basically just a matrix multiplication. And actually how this works with these mat matrix multiplication and the linear algebra is how simulators that simulate quantum computing work in all generalities. So it's actually not that absurd. It's not just maths. It's actually how the computations also work if you try to simulate. And then you get another vector somehow. And then just like one thing that's important. So usually quantum computers will always give you measurement samples. So this is what Nathan said, like um, if you measure a state, you get one result. You can't measure like all the amplitudes at once. So in this example, for example, if you measure all the qubits, you just like sample, you know, bit strings from this, um, from your quantum computer. And they're sampled from the probability distribution indicated by this bookkeeping state vector, so to speak. Um, and so for computations, this is sometimes a bit, yeah, not so nice, because if you want a prediction, for example, you don't want a sample. I mean, it can be interesting for other parts of machine learning, but um, in supervised learning, often we want deterministic predictions. So what we will be talking about is here, we sample and then we average. So think of a quantum computation, actually not as being one computation, but you have 10,000 computations and then you average over the re results. And what you get is approximately like a deterministic result. So it's an estimate basically. And mathematically, you get a scalar value because the mass here is this like nice like quadratic form. So you kind of like uh, have a row vector, a column vector, and some matrices in the middle. And then in the end, you get a scalar out. And that is basically uh, the output of an algorithm, quantum algorithm, as we see it here. And then obviously, like quantum computing, you don't do one operation, but you do lots of small operations usually. So you get these quantum gates represented by lots of unitary matrices. And now here's something that's really important, and you don't find this in every textbook so much, but more and more, basically. And this is, in near-term quantum computing, it's really hard to build these algorithms because you only have very small space. So you've got like your 50 qubits, and you've got maybe, I don't know, 100 gates maximum that you can apply before the result is so noisy on these devices we have at the moment that you can actually just throw it away. So what people started doing, they thought about um, a completely different paradigm of doing quantum computing, which uh, works with parametrized gates. So you just say, we have control parameters over these gates. So it's not just a fixed gate, but it's a whole gate family, so to speak. And you think again, this is like model family, right? So this is like another link I will use. Um, so we can basically kind of optimize our quantum computations. If we don't know how to build them, we just like make a general ansatz and then we optimize them to do something. So trainable or parametrized or variational quantum circuits is the key word. And this is what people investigate a lot in this near term quantum computing regime. Okay, that's it from here. Um, if you think of these three building blocks, so we also heard before, like you can, so if people, so often I get the question in talks like, is quantum, is quantum machine learning better than classical machine learning? And this question, please never, never ask this question. It is not a question you can have an answer to ever, ever, because, and if you get confused because everyone answers this question differently, it's because they, they replace your question with a completely different question that is much more precise and then answer that one. And you have no clue what they're actually answering. 
And this is because there's lots of different approaches with what you want to actually speed up, what you want to do better. For example, do you want to increase generalization performance? Do you want to speed up an algorithm? Do you want to find better solutions in an optimization problem? And so on and so forth. So there's a lot of different angles. So the question has to be boiled down much more. And as Nathan says, we still don't know everything, but to a couple of very specific questions, we have a lot of answers in the last two or three years in the field. And it's quite exciting. So just to say what I, what I have here, like, so there's a lot of things you could do with the data. You could speed up sampling from data. You can also ask if quantum computing can use fewer data samples. You can optimize, again, you can speed it up, but you can also like say something about quality of solutions. And this is the one, the model is the one that I'll do the last couple of slides now on is, um, what if you want to design uh, new models? You could also speed up models. You could say, take a neural network, can we speed it up? Completely different uh, can of worms. But what I want to talk about, what if we just replace the classical model with a new model that no one has an idea what it actually does, a quantum computation. And so what I now want to say is that this quantum computation is very similar to neural networks and how we can train it, but it is actually mathematically completely, completely almost the same. No, actually it is the same as kernel methods. And this is, you know, what I hope to kind of like bring across. Okay, so first of all, why can we train quantum circuits like neural networks? The idea is here, replace our model with a quantum circuit with some expectation or average over measurement results. This is this M here, uh, depending on some data. Um, and this is, uh, so you, if you find this under the keyword of parameterized quantum machine learning, variational quantum machine learning, near-term quantum machine learning. So it's one approach of many. And so in code, the idea looks, uh, so, I'm using this also to like uh, advertise a little bit uh, a software framework that uh, Xanadu we are we're busy developing since a couple of years, which is called Penny Lane, and this I think shows very nicely what we're actually doing here. On the left, you see um, a torch torch code, a super simple machine learning model, uh, machine learning example. You've got some data, a model, a loss or cost function here, average loss is your cost function, and then you optimize. And in Penny Lane, on the right side. The idea is literally that you can do exactly the same things in the same language, but you replace it by a quantum computation. So when I talk about replacing it, I literally mean you just take out that code and you plug in code that executes something on a quantum computer. So, yeah. And now like one or two thoughts, why can we train quantum circuits like neural networks? Because it's actually not that um, obvious. Um, so first of all, how does the quantum circuit look like that we want to train? As Nathan said, it always consists first of an encoding. So this is what I didn't show in the pictures earlier. We just had like some processing that depends on parameters. But in, in quantum machine learning, we also have this encoding step where we encode data somehow into a quantum circuit or in most of quantum machine learning, not always. And then we process and then we measure and we do this measurement and averaging thing. So this is the quantum circuit we now replace our machine learning model with. So why can we train it like neural networks? And then for this, you need to know that neural networks, Nathan also mentioned it, are trained by gradient descent methods. And gradient descent methods are basically just um, taking uh, information on what is the partial derivative of the cost with respect to parameters of your model in order to find a good next candidate for the parameters. And it does this iteratively. So um, neural network training is about gradient descent. Gradient descent is about gradients. But now what happens if you've got a quantum computation, like in the code example here, and Torch, for example, would now, when it starts training, ask the model, what is your gradient? I want to do gradient descent. And there's this really beautiful um, wealth of literature from the last couple of years that actually you can get a gradient out of a quantum model. If you don't, so you have a circuit here, want a gradient with respect, for example, for, for this gate parameter mu. You just have to evaluate the same circuit, but in this gate, you shift the parameter once to the right and once to the left. Not finite difference, so it's not a super small shift, it's actually a macroscopic shift. But what you get if you like um, add the two results with some coefficients, you get a so-called parameter shift rule. You get a, an analytic um, partial derivative of a quantum computation. If this was a bit complex, what I'm just saying, this type of research is very big and I'm just advertising it as well here. And it has enabled us to get gradients of quantum computations just using quantum computations. So very beautiful parts to think about. It goes very deep, higher order gradient uh, derivatives. What can you get? Uh, natural gradient algorithms on quantum computers and so on and so forth. And now the second point, and that is that quantum uh, models are kernel methods. And for many years, I always had a slide where I said like quantum models are somehow like kernel methods or similar to kernel methods. And I uh, sat down December and uh, wanted to like solidify that and just like write down, okay, lots of people are starting to like notice this as well, what's actually happening here. And I can now say, um, 
and I'll show you a reference if you're interested in this like just now, but that quantum models are actually kernel methods. In what sense? So for this, I think it's very much easier if we take this quantum circuit that we had, encoding, processing, measurement, and we put it into two blocks only. We interpret it as encoding and then a measurement. So that looks a bit strange because this is obviously like gates. Why are gates a measurement? But this is actually how quantum computing works in practice always. You have a very simple measurement in your lab. And what you do to get a complicated measurement is first you apply an algorithm. So basically you turn your quantum state into the right measurement basis. So in some sense, the entire neural network parameterized circuit, you can just interpret as training your measurement. So think of this as quantum machine learning. And now, What's happening here? So the encoding step is actually doing something very similar to these kernel methods I told you at the beginning. They map data into a really high dimensional feature space, as I said. So this is your quantum Herbert space. And now this is the second step that you, and this was already like noted like a couple of years back, but now only since like a year or so, uh, we start realizing that not only does it map into these spaces, but measurements define a linear decision boundary in that space. So you have a linear model in a high dimensional sp feature space, which is a kernel method. Um, for those of you who are a bit more involved in the maths, um, it gets a bit crazy here because if you write your quantum model down in density matrix notation, so this is just what those of you who know what this means, um, you can write it as a trace over the density matrix that encodes your data, there's your quantum state, times the measurement, which is this parameterized thing. Um, and for those of you who do a lot of like linear algebra, they know that a trace of two matrices can be interpreted as an inner product in the space of complex valued matrices. So it's a bit of a strange space. It's not the space of vectors that you know, but it's nevertheless a vector space in the mathematical sense of kernel methods. So what you have here is an inner product in a high dimensional space and your measurement is somehow like the weight vector of a linear model. Um, and so that means that like in these kernel methods, we can say everything about the model. We can train it, we can predict with it by throwing away the measurement altogether, throwing away this parameterized circuit and the whole computation away. The only thing we have to worry about is the embedding because what we need from the quantum computer is just these like, basically these multiplications where we have two states. So this was this like, remember this inner product of two feature states. Okay, this went very, very deep in like a quicker time. I promise you to point out the reference. So. There are lots of papers that kind of like use this or start using this. And this is the paper I spoke about like um, from December where I sat down and just like try to formalize it all and write it all up. So this is a bit of a summary of this idea. Okay, and this is like the same thing in pictures. Just think of quantum states representing data and the measurement chops through. And this is kind of like a linear model, like a support vector machine and something. Okay, cool. So now we kind of have like quantum models were trainable like neural networks and quantum models are kernel methods. And so the slots, quantum computations really into something interesting here because we have these like trainable composable models. We can train them like neural networks, but we can also understand them as kernel methods, which are very well understood theoretically. And at the moment, people are quite busy to prove that neural networks are nothing else than a kernel method under a certain uh, optimization method. And so in some sense, quantum models are already this hybrid. And this is like super interesting. What's happening out of this is like a big question that, that drives me at the moment. And last little bit, but just, just mentioning if people like Fourier stuff or they want to know what functions are these models actually. I mean, you always see these like trays of what is this actually? And it turns out you can show that they are just basically in many, many cases, just Fourier series. So a quantum model is basically just taking wave functions and adding them up with coefficients. And that's basically your model. And you know, with Fourier series, we can build very complex models. But this depends very much on how you encode your data. Your data encoding shows you how complex these Fourier series models are that you build. So this was all a bit much. If I want to summarize, you've learned from Nathan that quantum machine learning is all about, um, or a very important concept is the embedding, the encoding, and then also training. And what I try to show is basically that the embedding and the encoding refers is, is very much like what defines what a model is. Like it's this thinking of kernel methods. And then, um, but in training, we can also use like neural networks types approaches and we're kind of somewhere in, in between. Okay, cool. I hope uh, I caught up a bit of time, but if there are any questions, I'm very happy to hear them, especially because I won't be there for networking because <laughs> it's like past my yeah. bedtime. <laughs> no worries, no worries. Um, yeah, we do have some questions over here. I don't know if we'll be able to go through all of them. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask on behalf of the audience was, 
I heard that there's a residency program at Xanadu. Can yes. A bit more on that? The, yeah, the application uh, deadline is already over. And I have to admit that we had such a great resonance. So we were kind of only able to take 1% or something of the applications. So that's mm -hmm. definitely full and done. But I think it will be there next week again. But next week is QHack. So we have an... Um, quantum hackathon which will be really exciting it will be a bit like 80s style and fun and not just talks but also interviews and games and, and a lot of things and you can just register for free and just join uh you find this under qhack.ai q h a c k quack <laughs> thank you um so the other questions we have here are are the quantum gates very different from classical gates with transistors um, yes, so they are basically, so some of the quantum gates are actually immediately you can say like, okay, there's a not gate, a classical not gate, a quantum not gate. The only difference is that they are um, reversible. So there's this like uh, idea that classical gates have energy dissipation and quantum gates like they have to basically maintain probabilities, which means that um, they work in a slightly different way. But we know that any classical algorithm decomposed into gates can be mapped to a quantum algorithm decomposed into gates. So there is an equivalence between the two that's a bit deeper than just saying, okay, this gate is this and this gate is this. I see. Um, and I wanted to ask on behalf of people that want to get into quantum uh, machine learning, where do you start? Do you start with the quantum side or do you start with the machine learning side? What do you recommend? <laughs> I personally would really like to see that people start more with the machine learning side because I have the feeling for many years we were just a bunch of quantum computing people who knew like something about machine learning from textbooks. And I think that the real good quantum machine learning is done where you read machine learning papers as well. Mm -hmm. So definitely both. But um, yeah, do more machine learning than you think <laughs> because they are very clever, those guys. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think we don't have a lot of time. So maybe I'll leave it with one more question. Uh, but someone in the chat was saying that uh, they could tell the passion you have for um, quantum uh, machine learning and this field. And so they were asking, like, what your favorite field of quantum computing is? <laughs> well, <laughs> quantum machine. No, I have to admit, I'm one of these, uh, maybe that's uh, my biggest sin. I've never done anything else than quantum machine learning and quantum computing. So obviously mm -hmm. you learn a little bit like here and there and at the sides. But this is this was just because like while I was researching it as a PhD, kind of the field blew up. And since then it has just been such a roller coaster ride. So I should soon like think of something else just to get a bit diversified. So I think this is like my favorite part. And my favorite part about quantum machine learning is unfortunately machine learning because I'm just so fascinated by this question of generalization. I find that and Nathan knows this because we have a lot of discussions. We had a lot of discussions about this. I'm really not interested in speed ups. I, I couldn't care less about exponential speed ups. I'm really interested in the in how it works, like you know how quantum computers can classify. Yeah. Um, I think we still have one more question that we can go to. Um, someone is asking: Does the state of the qubits get entangled during the encoding process? Um, yes. So they can. So there are lots of different encodings and it's still an open question what entanglement actually adds as a resource but I would also be a bit careful because um, it took me a long time to understand I always thought oh entanglement is so special but actually entanglement a lot of entanglement is just correlation so it's a little bit more I understand that but often we find that people start saying oh the qubits entangle and this is totally quantum but Oftentimes, like classical algorithm can also entangle data, uh, can also correlate data, right? It's, statistics is all about correlations. So I would be a bit careful with like um, thinking that entanglement is the thing. That's very difficult to actually like subdivide. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much sorry, for your presentation. Um, sorry. Aki, can I from... just cut in here? Yep. Yeah. What's okay, up? Um, sorry. Hi, Maria. I'm one of the, I'm the vice chair of IEEE UFT. Um, thank you for the talk. Um, yeah. Someone in the chat wanted to ask if there was any way they could get the PowerPoint used. Oh yeah, of course. Uh, it's not. I'm actually doing it in LaTeX, but I give you the PDF. Um, please just send me an email or how. To, wait, could I give it to you as the organizers? Could you just? Oh um, yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. We can yeah. email that out. Yeah. Yeah. No, of course. Awesome. Thank what? you so much. Thank you again, Maria. So yeah, so if you can, uh, we'll email you again after, after to, uh, if you could share, share us the presentation, we can forward it to the participants. Great, cool, awesome. awesome. Thank you so much for a wonderful talk. Okay, uh, so it is now 4.40.
and I hope everybody had a chance to grab something to eat or uh, grab the grab a very quick uh, couple of water and we will be continuing uh, with our presenters. Um, right now we will be featuring Henning Deckens. Henning Deckens is the CEO and co-founder of RTST QBnet, a company that uh, created an open source uh, analytics platform that allows data scientists to augment Python into a full-blown quantum computing toolbox. Um, he's received his Master of Sciences in Physics in 1996 and his MBA in 1999. He's also the founder of Quantum Computing Meetups in GTA. Uh, and in addition, uh, he's been hosting uh, a, a blog called Observations on Quantum Computing and Physics and talks about the impact of quantum computing and the impacts it will have on the IT industry. Uh, please help me welcome Henning Dakin. Henning, it's all yours. All right. Well, thank you for the warm introduction here. Uh, again, I um, apologize for talking from upside down world here, but uh, um, just want to make sure that you uh, can see my screen now, sharing it again. And here we go. So um, yeah, I'm just taking you through um, my uh, web page here. If you um, want to point anybody to um, have an assessment done um, for uh, how quantum computing is going to impact the uh, data science um, department uh, going forward, um, please point them to, to our website. Um, our um, open source um, compute stack uh, is on, on uh, GitHub. Um, we maintain a private one as well, so we, we update that uh, ever so often. Um, but uh, if, if you want to um, work with the software, um, the stable version you will always find here. And uh, we are always very happy about pull requests and, and people actually uh, uh, trying out what, we, what we're building. Um, and um, again, uh, I did um, found this uh, quantum computing meetup um, many, many years ago. Um, so I've been talking about quantum computing for, for quite some time now. Um, and my background really, um, other than a physics degree um, and the business degree um, was in data science. So that's really uh, my core interest. Uh, how is quantum computing going to impact um, everything that we do with data right now? And uh, we heard quite a bit about machine learning er earlier. Um, and uh, what I'm going to present uh, is essentially uh, another, another avenue into that world. Um, that very much connects back to what, uh, what we heard from Nathan and, uh, and Maria earlier. Um, but uh, since it is the afternoon um, and uh, uh, it was a long uh, couple of hours of, of pretty um, heavy material that we, we went through, um, I always like to uh, start off a little bit, um, yeah, with a, with a uh, kind of a mix so it's hopefully a little bit entertaining. Um, and I usually do that, obviously, when there's a, a meetup uh, in person, I, I like to ask people to, to participate and to, to raise their arms, which we can't really do here, but we do have the chat function. Um, so uh, let's try to wake everybody up a little bit by, by asking you a question um, for a change, and instead of always you getting to ask the questions. Um, and my, my first question would be, um, if you know this guy, if you're really, really, really old, you probably will. Um, and if you can read my screen, you probably it's kind of a giveaway. But um, it, it's uh, it, it's somebody who's actually um, known for a log logic puzzle, uh, and uh, he's probably the only entertainer um, to be to be known in in, in the history of, of philosophy and, and paradoxes. Um, so anyhow, um, let me see if I can look at my chat here. Um, so I saw a couple of things. I'll do this on my phone. Yep, here we go. So already got somebody uh, identifying this as a Monty Hall problem. Um, so but whenever I, I'm, I'm in, a, uh, in a room like this, in a meetup room, and it depends on, on the, the kind of audience we have. But uh, typically, there are a couple of people who have not yet really heard about the Monty Hall problem, although it's almost as favorite um, or as, as uh, famous as uh, showing us cat these days. Um, but uh, for those who haven't heard of it, um, here's a footage from the original show that made it 
famous. Beautiful uh, 60s and 70s decor. Actually, let me switch over to uh, full screen here and make this maybe a little bit bigger. Um, so the, the crux of the problem is that uh, Monty has this wonderful uh, game show um, and uh, people in the end have the opportunity to get a really, really grand prize. But the grand prize is just behind one of those doors. Um, and the participants who made it through the entire show now has to choose what door. Um, and two of the doors are that's two of the doors are going to be completely nothing. And the other one could be a car, uh, it could be a huge amount of cash. Uh, typically, um, yeah, some companies were sponsoring it. So uh, some really cool gear that people would be getting behind one of those doors. Um, so pretty straightforward problem. Um, if you don't have any information and you just make one choice, it's a one third chance that you're gonna get it right. Um, so you make your choice. And then Monty is a really, really nice guy. So what Monty does is after you made a choice, he's opening one of the other doors. And uh, then uh, um, after he opened uh, one of the doors, um, that, that obviously is he's not going to have the one that uh, opened the one that has a price behind it. Uh, he's going to ask the participant, well, after I open this door now, do you want to reconsider your decision? Do you want to change or do you want to stick with the original decision? Um, and uh, for those who don't know the Monty Hall problem um, and uh, want to basically experience that, uh, that problem for, for themselves, uh, um, yeah, just uh, write in the chat if you, if you rather, rather would stick with your original choice or if you would change one of those stores. All right, so the people who know the problem, um, all right. We already have uh, we already have people basically you're, you're spilling it out uh, it's 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 an informed crowd here that we're dealing with um so my meetups i i often get people who who haven't heard of that problem yet uh, which i always find astounding and always happy to to have people who haven't heard it yet um and um and there are people quite often who, who want to stick with their initial um this decision um actually in the um uh, my, my company went through the uh the CDL, the quantum um, stream that uh, was mentioned earlier in the earlier presentation. And uh, uh, obviously everybody in this uh, quantum computing stream, um, they were all very, very, very smart people. Um, and uh, there was this one uh, physicist couple from, from Iran, um, really charming people. He was an experimentalist, he was a, th a theorist, and they have not heard of the Monty Hall problem before. So I, I, uh, I walked them through it and it was pretty funny because the physicist uh, who was the, uh, the husband, um, he wanted to stick with his choice um, and his wife who was a theorist but said, no, yeah, you, want, you want to change. Um, so let's, let's game this out. Um, let's see exactly why um, one decision here is vastly superior to the other. Um, and um, oops, that's exactly why I prepared the other one. There's a live, um, there's a live notebook here. Actually, I may not just not have initialized it properly. Let me just go through these things. Um, so let's use our software. I always like to do it with the actual software because um, I just like to, I guess, run with the risk. Yeah, but no, it is not running. Okay, let's switch to that one here that I have open. Um, so the way, the way to model that, um, simply is um, by, by what's called a decision um, theory uh, as, as a Bayesian network. Um, and it's something that data scientists are, are pretty familiar with. Um, and um, essentially you, you can condition on um, your, your first choice and you can condition on where the price is. Um, and uh, when you game this out, and, and this is not very readable, so I have a nice readable, um, a table here um, that gives you all the joint um, probabilities. Uh, essentially, essentially, you have um, all sorts of combination of where um, a door could be. And, and we label the door here in, in typical computer science fashion from zero, one, and two. So it's not door one to three, it's, it's, it's door zero, one, and two. Um, and 
So your choice could be uh, either zero, one, or two. Um, and the price could be behind any one of those doors, zero, one, or two. Um, so if you just do a brutal enumeration of all possibilities, that is the table you're getting. Um, and, and then that is essentially um, the probability space for each of these combinations. Um, and now what uh, a Bayesian network really does is nothing but a simplistic way, uh, not, not simplistic, it's, it, it looks simplistic because it looks like an inference diagram, but it's actually um, a precise mathematical representation of the joint probabilities. Um, and um, you, you basically um, have the error representing um, the influences, influences that uh, uh, can, can uh, flow in your, uh, in your decision um, system here. Um, so to, to make a long story short, um, when Monty opens the door, he doesn't really have a choice um, because if you happen to have the choice uh, that um, allows you to stick with the door, if you actually pick the price correctly at the beginning, so you, you got lucky, there's one third chance um, that, that you're basically gambling on when you do your first choice that actually worked out. So with 33% um, uh, percent chance, uh, you, you pick it correctly. Um, that chance really does, is not affected by Monty doing anything, but what is affected is Monty's choice in opening doors. If, if you pick the price correctly the first time around, if you if I pick the correct door, uh, Monty has a, still a choice. You can open either of the other doors because both other doors don't contain the price. But if you happen to pick one of the doors that does not have the price, so what is the more likely outcome? Um, let's say, for instance, um, you pick the first door, number zero, uh, then that means the price has to be um, in two of the other doors, right? So if Monty opens door number one, that is because door number one does not have the price behind it. He only, he only has one door really he can open at that point because he does not want to reveal the price. So by being forced into opening that one door, he essentially gives away information. Um, and the information, of course, is conditioned on where the, uh, where the actual price is. So if you, get it, if you get it right, he has a choice. He can, he can open either door, but if you don't get it right, yeah, he doesn't have a choice anymore. He has to open the other door, and that basically indicates to you that the ch chances now of switching is higher. Um, and really, the, the easiest way to think about it, your choice that you first made, the one-third chance, that chance did not change when Monty opens a door. But now there's only one other alternative left after he opened the door. And your one third chance is still the same. But now the other alternative, it has to come out to a probability of one again, is two third. So the, the, the chance of getting it right if you change is two third. Um, and, and intuitively, that is not really all that, that clear with three doors. And it, it's kind of funny if you just change the, the number of doors around and, and uh, keep the problem the same, it's, it's actually much more intuitive. Uh, if, you, if you think you have 100 doors and behind one of the doors is, is, uh, is that price, um, and, and then you only have a 100th chance of getting it right if you, if you get a choice um, to make. And now Monty goes and opens 98 of the remaining doors. Uh, that gives you a pretty clear idea, you know, okay, there's one door that he did not open. Why did he not open that one? Well, probably because that's the one that has the, uh, the price in it. So uh, with 100 doors, it's, it's the same kind of math, 100th of a chance to get it right. Uh, and so you have 99% chance uh, with the other door. Um, so that's, that's the famous Monty Hall problem. Um, and, uh, and again, this is just all classical probability. So, so why, why, do I, why do I show you guys this? Well, uh, we, we call ourselves artistic binet for a reason. That's because 
we took the concept of classical decision theory and uh, uh, put it into the quantum world. Because the funny thing actually is that um, when you're looking at uh, the kind of algebra and, and the kind of machines that you have when, when, uh, when, when you're doing quantum logic, um, they are probabilistic machines in, intrinsically. And we heard this earlier uh, when talking about uh, the machine learning. Uh, what, what they do is essentially they give you a sample. They give you a sample of a distribution. Um, and when you're creating a quantum circuit, um, or the nice thing even is it doesn't have to be a quantum circuit. Uh, it could be any other uh, quantum device that you, for instance, initialize like a, like a D-wave machine. Um, where, where you have uh, just a Hamiltonian that you structure. Um, so any, any quantum device that is tunable uh, in, in the end is a sampling device. You're, you're running the experiment over and over and over again, um, and it gives you a distribution, a data distribution, that if you have your problem encoded in the way that you tune your quantum device, it is going to give you an answer. So if you, for instance, think about the most famous algorithm Shor's algorithm, which kind of like got everything excited because it's, it scales exponentially. Um, in order to get an answer, um, like let's say um, the, the one that, that has been actually run on the quantum computer right now is the uh, factorization of the number 21. <laughs> That's actually the only, the only number that has been factorized on a quantum computer um, to this date uh, with Shor's algorithm because our quantum computers are just so small. Um, so uh, 21, it's three times seven. Um, and uh, what, what basically shows algorithm uh, kind of produces for you is if you, if you just write out your, your number line, one, two, three, four, five, et cetera, until, until seven, um, it gives you a histogram. It's going to ever so often say three, it's going to say ever so often seven. Sometimes it's going to get us wrong because it's a, it's a probabilistic machine. So sometimes there's gonna be still a two in there, uh, but if you just run it and run it and run it uh, and look at the histogram, you're gonna get mostly three and mostly seven. They're gonna be spikes above the seven and the three. And if you just keep running it long enough, uh, the fidelity is, is you, you can make the fidelity as, as um, precise as you want, but just keep running the experiment. Um, so th th that is essentially, what a quantum computer is, it's, it's a sampling device. Um, and that is also how uh, uh, typically when you set up um, a Bayesian network and you want to understand um, the conditional probabilities, um, the way that you train them is by, by sampling. Um, so if you have a structure and you're not sure about the structure um, of a Bayesian network, you basically just try out all different kinds of structures um, and see if what is a sampling that the Bayesian network will provide, provide you is similar enough to, to, the, to the reality. Um, and um, that essentially is what, what from, from a training perspective, is where the, where the immediate connection uh, can be made between a Bayesian network and, uh, and a classical um, sampling device. Um, so that's actually one way you can, you can use quantum computers to train these things. Um, but there's a much more interesting a uh, deeper connection really um, between um, classical Bayesian networks um, and quantum computing that I, that I wanna uh, kind of just hint at here because uh, the, the time obviously is very limited. Um, so I, I'm probably just gonna skip over the Bayesian network fundamentals here, just gonna show you a little bit um, how, yeah, so how the sampling looks like here in a histogram. Um, so here is the histogram essentially for um, if, you, if you sample um, uh, an experiment that is a Monty Hall experiment. Um, and of course we can make much more complicated structures um, and we can actually use these Bayesian networks to do inference. Um, and for students, um, I, I figure that one is, is one that uh, uh, is gonna resonate. Um, of course it's based for American students so the achievement is really super important, um, uh, but, but essentially it's, uh, it, it allows a way to, to reason with, uh, with uncertainty and, and with, with fuzzy um, terms and, and uh, 
um, random variables um, that uh, that can be encoded but still be meaningful. So uh, you can, for instance, define is um, a certain class difficult or not, um, and and you can ask about well, the intelligence of the students. Um, and how does it influence actually the outcomes on GMAT? How does it influence the grades in a course? And how does that influence the chances of getting a letter from a recommendation letter from a professor? Um, so there are these kind of problems that are very down to earth uh, kind of decision problems uh, can be modeled in a probabilistic manner uh, and can be reasoned with. Um, and again, it's if you if you just do a, a raw enumeration, it's, it's you have all these different storylines essentially. Um, and for each of them, you have a certain probability. Um, and these probabilities sometimes can, can look counterintuitive um, if you look at the actual, um, if you actually run this on a, on a population. Um, it, and it depends on really how we encode these random variables. Um, so typically, for instance, if we just have um, a random variable where we say, well, people here are um, average or, or below average uh, intelligence, and then we have just some people who are really very high intelligence. Um, and then we look at the, the probabilities um, when we condition on some of these. Um, we sometimes still see um, when we train these Bayesian networks on actual population that uh, depending on the way that we define our random variables, uh, we don't have outcomes necessarily uh, being the most probable ones that, that if you just look at the, um, at the decision problem uh, is it, the one that you would expect. Um, for, for instance, uh, if you define intelligence as something that's very rare and underlying population, um, people who end up with a letter are not necessarily always the ones who we would also consider as, as highly intelligent because um, the most student population, you know, they're going to go um, to a certain point, let's say, if, if, if say high intelligence IQ over 130 or whatnot, um, then the underlying population of, of really highly intelligent people is still going to be uh, much lower than than the people who are just in the in the mass pool. But people with a, uh, with average intelligence can still get very good grades if they just work hard or whatnot. So um, the underlying population essentially just gives us uh, the largest pool here still. Um, but anyhow, I mean, that's just uh, one little synthetic um, um, example um, for the student world. Um, and uh, the, the uh, application really of these things is, is where it becomes more serious and, 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 and they are applied quite a bit um, is in the medical field. Um, and, and this is kind of a classic example, um, goes back to, I, th I think the, uh, the early, uh, early 90s or late 80s even, um, where you basically have to uh, make differential di diagnosis based on certain tests that you're running. Um, and in all of this, every, every med medical diagnosis essentially is um, if inference under uncertainty. Um, and you can always draw a Bayesian diagram um, for these kind of decision-making processes. Um, so the medical field really is, uh, is one that, uh, um, uh, that, that has been pioneering this, uh, this approach to decision making early on, uh, because you can't have um, any black box decision making in, in this kind of process. Every, every decision that a, that a, a doctor makes has to be supported by data if it's, if it's uh, uh, properly done. Um, and so drawing out these, these decision networks um, for in the medical field, and pre-structuring these networks, uh, that is typically where Bayesian networks started. They were not originally an approach to machine learning um, because you could pre-structure them. And that is still uh, a huge advantage of that approach to what has now become machine learning um, because the priors, um, the prior knowledge uh, can be embedded in, in, in that kind of structure. Um, now, you may ask, well, if that, is something that you know gives you a decision-making um, toolbox that is transparent. Uh, why is, is Bayesian networks not the dominant um, field in, in machine learning these days? Why, why is deep learning um, and, and all these neural network uh, things uh, you know the, the, the most um, exciting 
game in town when it comes to machine learning these days. And if I haven't really heard probably even of, of Bayesian networks when it comes to machine learning. Well, the reason for that is that um, they are probabilistic systems. Um, and that means that calculating the gradient, if you want to train them, um, is not trivial. Um, you basically have to run a lot, a lot of, a lot of samples uh, and then estimate the gradient, uh, very similar to what Maria talked about earlier. Because again, when you run now deep learning structures on a, a quantum computer, by the nature of a quantum computer, you are forced into the sampling um, arena and, and you can't really just have one measurement and determine and calculate back the gradient and then propagate that gradient back uh, to, to change the weights. Um, with Bayesian networks in, inherently in the structure because they are probabilistic inference, um, we, we never had the luxury to be able to, to just calculate um, gradients back across the entire network easily um, and uh, uh, get the correct result easily that way. Um, it's always has always been a sampling exercise. Um, and especially if you have large uh, Bayesian networks, um, you, you run the same kind of uh, scaling issue uh, that you have with a traveling salesman problem, right? Every, every node uh, could be potentially connected to another node. You don't know, if you don't know anything about um, your problem domain, you don't know what variables are going to influence other variables. So where the, where the advantage of Bayesian networks lies is if you, if you know something about, about your problem and you can pre-structure it, um, you can reduce uh, the, the, the complexity space. But if you don't have that knowledge, um, if you're complete, completely blind, uh, then training uh, Bayesian networks um, is, is super exponentially hard. Um, and, and again, that is then of course where uh, the question comes in, well, could um, quantum computers help us with that? Um, and the answer is yes, to some extent. Um, but to uh, tie back to what Professor Emerson just told us and, and gave us a, a nice little reality check, um, most quantum algorithms out there are actually not exponentially speed up quantum algorithms. Um, but that doesn't mean there's not a speed up uh, that, that won't become relevant. Uh, the second most famous quantum algorithm is, is Grover's search. Um, algorithm uh, because it's the most fundamental problem really in, in, in data science is sorting an unsorted list. Um, now, can a quantum computer do that expon exponentially faster? Not that we know of, but Crowe's algorithm uh, can prove a polynomial speed up. Um, so one way basically to, to accelerate uh, the training of, of Bayesian networks is if you had a large enough quantum computer um, in the gate model um, to take that on yet would be uh, to use a, a variant of, um, of Grover's algorithm. Um, but then there are other ways to embed that problem um, in other architectures. Um, and we have heard D-Wave mentioned here before, but we haven't really seen any examples um, for D-Wave. Um, but one of the companies actually sponsoring this, uh, this talk, I think is Sapata, um, and the co-founder of it, uh, uh, Professor Asper Yusek, um, uh, he uh, co-wrote a paper and, and then patented it um, for training, uh, structure training of Bayesian networks um, on a quantum annealer. Um, and quantum annealing is what, uh, what the D-Wave machine is, is doing. Um, and the interesting thing is if you, if you can find approaches that work on uh, quantum annealers, um, they don't have the overhead that they re require with gate-based architectures. Uh, Gabriel's architecture is you really want very good error correction. Otherwise, um, a couple of, of steps into your algorithm, uh, the noise is going to overwhelm the signal. Um, and uh, in a quantum annealing architecture, you don't have to worry about the noise as much. Um, and uh, that is why uh, D-Wave uh, has chips out there with now with uh, 2,000 qubits. Um, and they can still do potentially useful things if you find a way to formulate your problem. Uh, in a way well, Henning, uh, so, sorry to cut you off. Um, yep. We're running a little bit short on time. Yeah, um, let me just make a quick, quick uh, connection here to to the quantum rule. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that's, that's just the, the one interesting thing that I, I want to get um, across here. 
uh, when we talked about uh, uh, classical relation networks, we talked about stories, about enumerating all possible scenarios. Um, and if you're a physicist, this may um, remind you a little bit of um, the, the way that you can um, formulate and, 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 and get uh, classical mechanics established uh, by the least action principle, where you basically look at every possible trajectory, um, and then we, we just optimize for the one that is the, the least action uh, uh, trajectory. Uh, and that has been generalized in, in quantum mechanics as a uh, famous path integral. Um, so without much further ado, um, basically what I just want to throw out there for you guys is that if you replace the, the classical probabilities in a Bayesian network with uh, complex value probabilities, uh, you can actually encode any physical system, uh, including the famous double slit experiment that all of you heard about at one point or another. Um, and, and if you do that, um, then the, the which way information um, of the double slit experiment, where we, where we switch from, from having a, a classical in, uh, um, uh, projection on the screen to the interference of the quantum, uh, quantum realm, um, <clears throat> that which way information is the same thing as conditioning on a node uh, in a Bayesian network. Um, so, uh, we, we can essentially just use the same structure that we use in, in classical um, reasoning about probabilities uh, by, by simply switching out the classical ones to uh, the wave function, the complex valued uh, probability values that, that go into a, a quantum wave, fun wave function, and, and we get the same kind of structure. It's, it's the same, it is the very same math. The algebra all holds up. It's just that now all of a sudden, instead of a, a real value, we're working with this complex values. Um, and uh, engineers here should be happy to see that we actually use a J for it instead of an I, <laughs> like the physicists physicist do. Um, so when you, when you uh, um, play this out, um, essentially um, you're just looking at one spot now, a screen where we have absolutely zero um, uh, chance of getting anything um, when, we're, when we're in the, uh, in the domain of um, um, not, not knowing. Um, when we're in the domain of knowing what, uh, what path uh, uh, the, the classical particle takes. So in the classical world, we know there's not gonna be any probability to find something in this particular spot on our screen. If we then can uh, open it up and we don't have the betray information, if you go to the quantum world, all of a sudden we get a probability um, on, on the screen here. And so if you wanna basically have the full interference pattern, you would just uh, create a Bayesian network um, like that, uh, where, where you basically just, um, a stack out across the entire screen. Um, and it's one of these exercises that I, I, I will probably do at one point. Um, but that's basically just where I want to leave you off uh, because these stories that we had, these possibilities we have when you, when you look at the classical world, that is essentially what in the quantum world we would call the multiverse theory. Um, so all these, all these different paths, all these different possibilities that a quantum system can take um, are enumerated um, and, and actually flow into uh, the, the, the probability that we measure in, in, in the end. Um, and, and that's basically the connection between the classical and the quantum, uh, uh, quantum world. So that's, that's, uh, that's uh, kind of uh, what I wanted to get out here, just to kind of like open a little bit the perspective of how, how the quantum probabilities and, and the classical probabilities relate back to quantum computing. Wonderful, thank you so much, Henning. All right, um, thank you. Unfortunately, we don't have any time for, uh, to take for questions. We are uh, running a little bit behind the schedule. So uh, unfortunately we have to do, or we do have to skip the questions. Uh, but uh, to the audience that, uh, just a note to the audience that Henning is also staying for, for the networking session. So if you do have any questions from him, uh, feel free to uh, ask him then. By all means. So uh, let, allow me to just share my screen. And for our final and last speaker, Professor uh, Sorin Wanigascu. Uh, professor Sorin Wanigascu is, uh, is a professor at the University of Toronto ECE Department, uh, Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. He has received his PhD degree in Electrical and Computer Engineering from the University of Toronto in 1994. And his research focuses on atomic scale electronic devices and integrated cir circuits for silicon quantum computing along with other areas of research. He has also conducted research in, on technologies and circuits uh, for MMM 
wave radio, radar and sensors, and on fiber optic systems. Uh, please help me welcome Professor Soren Monigascu. Professor, it's all yours. Thank you. Uh, I hope uh, everybody is still uh, awake. Let me, oh, sorry, let me see if you can see my screen. You should be able to see my screen now, I hope. Yes, we can see your screen. Okay, so let's, yeah, so the presentation. So uh, let's switch the topics and talk a little bit about hardware. A lot of uh, very interesting presentations and points have been made before, but there's still one missing. Uh, that's all very sobering, that all the present day quantum computers, uh, like the ones from IBM and Google, not all of them, because the photonics ones work at higher temperature, the ones that are uh, the most successful to date operate at 10 milli Kelvin or 20 milli Kelvin. That's milli Kelvin. Yeah. So that's what this uh, presentation is going to be about. How we solve that problem along with many of the other problems that have been uh, mentioned previously. So this is that famous state of the art computer on the left hand side from Google. And this is what the ENIAC computer looked like in 1946, before the transistor was invented in 1947. So that's where we are now. That's why we're looking for different qubit technologies because quantum computing today uh, is difficult because we do not have a qubit. You can write all the software you want. We can build all the control electronics that we want and that's my speciality. But until we built a qubit that has high fidelity, as was mentioned previously, like the transistor has, uh, it's going to be very hard to do anything practical on a quantum computer. And that's why you need to scale to introduce very sophisticated error, error correction schemes. Uh, I'm very familiar with those. I used to work at Nortel in the 1990s. And anything, uh, the high-speed internet connections at 10 gigabit then at Nortel had to have an error rate of 10 to the minus 12. The high speed internet connections today have an error rate of 10 to the minus three. They can be corrected. Uh, so, so that's why quantum uh, computing scientists are hoping that if they use a 10 to the minus three error rate per qubit, because that's where it is today, they maybe will be able due to error correction uh, to, uh, to implement a, a quantum computer that is powerful enough to implement maybe a few hundred logical qubits. Uh, but in order to do that, you need about 1 million physical qubits. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the difference between logical and physical qubits and the difference in what I understand as a circuit and what was presented previously as a quantum circuit, which is in my mind, just an algorithm, it has nothing to do with a physical circuit. So just to put things in perspective, forget the qubits, the qubits are here and they could be superconducting photonics qubits, uh, semiconductor qubits, which I'm going to talk briefly about. All the control of all these qubits are done using control electronics that are essentially the cell phone. Yeah? So every qubit currently is driven by something much larger than a cell phone, is a rack of instruments here. And we hope that in one day, uh, maybe in the next few years, we'll have a cell phone driving a qubit or maybe five to 10 qubits. And it, we're talking about a cell phone that is much more complicated than a 5G cell phone, which you don't yet have, have because the current 5G cell phones operate more like the 4G cell phones. They do not operate at millimeter wave frequencies where you can in, indeed have a 10%, 10 times increase in, in the data rate compared to what 4G cell phones uh, were supposed to, uh, to have, yeah. So current 5G cell phones were what 4G cell phones were supposed to have 10 years ago, but they didn't. So, so that's what you have to keep in mind that in order to drive a single qubit, you need today for these superconducting qubits in the Google or IBM processor, uh, or in the D-Wave one for that matter, because they are all actually using the same technology, that of superconducting qubits. Uh, so you need a five gigahertz to seven gigahertz range signal, which is an analog signal. Quantum computing has nothing to do with digital logic and digital signal. It's all RF circuits. So that's very important to keep in mind. So this is the technology that D-Wave, IBM, and uh, Google are using. It's called uh, superconducting Josephson junction technology. This is the qubit array. It's a two-dimensional array of qubits. The crosses here represents the actual physical qubits. 
and the uh, uh, blue rectangles represent couplers. So this is the equivalent circuit of such a qubit. This is the actual physical implementation. They are fabricated in an old CMOS fab from the early 2000s. Yeah, they use CMOS technology, but they use a much simpler version of the CMOS technology, but it's 20 years old technology. And the size of the qubit, this is a hundred micron scale here. It's about one millimeter by one millimeter. So if you want to scale that uh, Google processor to a million qubits, it'll be larger than a stadium. And it consume the power of several nuclear power stations. So that's the problem with the current technology. So uh, another reason about temperature is that when we create a qubit, we need a two level quantum system. And in a Josephson junction qubit, this is actually a, a, pseudo, a pseudo spin. The entire infrastructure of quantum computing is based on the electron spin one half system. All the other implementations that do not actually use a physical spin of, in, of qubits in quantum computing are fake and they're known as pseudo spins. And the problem uh, in the Josephson junction superconducting uh, uh, qubits is that this energy separation between the first and second energy level, if you want, between zero state and one state, is only about 500 milli-degrees Kelvin. So you have to operate at a temperature that is at least 10 times smaller in order for thermal noise not to affect your operation. Not only that, since this energy difference corresponds to about five gigahertz, if you bring your cell phone next to the computer, it's going to be to get garbage. So nothing will work because the computer works with the equivalent of one electron or one photon at five gigahertz, whereas your cell phone has millions of, of uh, electrons that will pollute the quantum computer. So this is the challenge today, just to put things in perspective. So among other challenges listed here, but we don't have time, so I'm going to skip over them. So what we're proposing, is to use the same technology for the qubit as for the electronics that control the qubit. So remember what I said, all the electronics, irrespective of the qubit technology you use, uh, are the same. So if we could make the electronics uh, and the qubits be implementing the same technology, and if we can make the qubits operate at a slightly higher temperature, then we could actually scale because another big problem is that all these quantum computers are essentially cryostats that operate at uh, 20 millikelvin, but in a cryostat, you cannot dissipate a lot of thermal power. So if you add any control electronics to that uh, Josephson junction qubit array, the cryostat will not work anymore. The temperature of the qubits will rise and the computer will be garbage. Uh, so in order to scale quantum computers, you have to raise the temperature of the qubits in order to integrate the electronics with the qubits. Otherwise, you're going to end up with those very long 50 ohm cables, uh, like the ones, you, let's say, that connect your computer or your uh, monitor to your computer, uh, but they're usually even longer than that and consume a lot of power. So the idea here is that Moore's law is coming to an end. So classical computing is over too. So uh, Nathan mentioned earlier that, oh, you can scale a classical computer. No, you cannot. We've reached the end of scale. Yeah, with, with Moore's law is actually coming to an end. Uh, there will be maybe another node, three nanometer node. But the nice thing about it is that when the transistor can no longer be scaled, it becomes a qubit. Quantum effects dominate and Today, we see quantum effects in the smallest transistors, commercial transistors, even at about 50 degrees Kelvin. So about uh, a thousand times higher temperature than the uh, temperature at which the uh, IBM and the Google quantum computer operate. So actually, this is a top view of a transistor. This is a trans, uh, cross section through a commercial transistor from tw in 22 nanometer FDSY technology from Global Foundries that used to be IBM. And we actually make the qubit in the smallest transistor size. And you see that this 70 nanometer, the gate length is 80 nanometer. It's a thousand times smaller than the Google or IBM qubit. So it's very well scalable. And, and uh, to cut things short, so we can create below this gate a quantum well where we have two energy levels that are uh, separated by uh, two to five milli electron volts. And then we apply a magnetic field and we split the first energy level into two separate levels that form the uh, spin up and spin down states. And we use electron or whole spin uh, to uh, create the qubit. Now, 
you were asking, somebody was asking earlier, how do you control the qubit? This is what the qubit does. So we apply a signal in our case because we want to operate at high temperature, uh, at, at least 10 times higher temperature than, than the uh, existing processes. So if you want to operate the qubit at higher temperature, you have to drive it at much higher frequencies. So we apply an 80 gigahertz signal, which is about 20 times higher than what is in your cell phone, uh, to the qubit gate. Uh, at the what's called spin resonant frequency or spin control frequency. And what you get out is the probability of having a spin up or spin down or zero or one state at the output, which is the quantum operation, if you want. And you see here what happens to the qubit state on the block sphere. And, and, and it rotates around the block sphere at this uh, Rabi frequency, which is actually the clock frequency of a quantum computer. And you actually want this Rabi frequency to be as fast as possible because you want to uh, execute as many quantum gate operations within the lifetime of the qubit, which was mentioned earlier. The lifetime of the qubit dictates the depth of your algorithm or the depth of the circuit that was mentioned earlier. And unfortunately today you cannot do more than a hundred quantum gate operations on existing computers because their lifetime is so short in the, or the order of one microsecond that if you're algorithm runs longer than a, a one microsecond, the result is garbage. So in order to increase the complexity of the computer, you either have to operate to, to execute the operations much faster, and that's what we're doing here, or you have to increase the lifetime of the, really you should do both. Uh, all right, so this is what we're proposing. We're proposing to integrate together both the qubits and the actual entire computer is a shift register on which you sequentially operate, uh, execute those uh, quantum gates. So the qubit is at the same time the quantum gate and the quantum circuit and the memory. So everything occurs in this qubit array and the results you just read afterwards and amplify, uh, and then you submit to some sort of switch that distinguishes whether you had a spin up or spin down. And that's where classical logic uh, is applied. Uh, but, um, uh, but, but all the spin manipulation is performed using RF signals, analog mixed signal signals. Now, just to get a perspective of how scalable semiconductor qubits are. Well, one of these qubits consumes about uh, uh, 10 picoamps, like five picoamps uh, of power. In a classical processor today, you have 50 billion, billion transistors. We use those transistors as qubits. So today we can integrate 50 billion qubits on a, on a die that is 2.5 by 2.5 centimeters. So that's possible. It's just that you have to make those qubits uh, work with very high fidelity. So the qubit array and the integration using standard CMOS technology is not a problem. Uh, the problem in all cases, in all quantum computer implementations is the actual spin manipulation electronics. That's where the power consumption is. So they all suffer from this problem, but we do them in the same technology as the qubits. Everybody else has to use exactly the same technology that we do in order to control the ion trap of photonics qubits or uh, Josephson junction superconducting qubits. So uh, that's the idea. I'm going to stop here. If you have questions, I have some other animation uh, later on. Uh, and this is what uh, people were talking about earlier. Uh, this is the physical, there's five physical qubits here from the Google processor and you see the so-called quantum circuit. This is not a quantum circuit, what you see here. It's simply executing these sequential gate operations on this very same physical qubit in time. And these are control signals uh, at five gigahertz or so that are applied in order to execute those quantum gate operations. Uh, with that, I'm done, thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Waningescu. Um, that was a very uh, insightful presentation. I, I only wish we had more time, uh, but for anyone who's also interested uh, in learning more about the topic or uh, listen more to Professor Waningescu, he is going to be joining us uh, for the networking session. And unfortunately, we have been going over time uh, for the event by 15 minutes. Um, let me just share my slides very quick. Um, there is actually um, uh, there is there was actually one question from the audience, uh, Professor Monigescu. Uh, sure. So, uh, do you predict that computers will be able to handle more than hundred gates in the future? 
Oh yeah, for sure. There's no problem to, to it's, I didn't mention about the fact that the biggest challenge today, and, and, and I also didn't mention the number of companies that are actually working on, on sem, uh, quantum processors with uh, semiconductor qubits, that's Intel, Leti, iMac, uh, so, um, uh, that's going to happen. Okay, in wonderful. The next five years. They all have roadmaps for that to happen in the next mm -hmm. five years or so. There's actually a startup in California that claims they have uh, three, 400 qubits in the same, uh, on a single chip with all the control electronics and the same technology that we are using. It's just that I think... Uh, they got ahead of themselves. They actually don't know what they have because testing is the biggest problem. So, um, uh, and testing and the time it takes to test uh, such a 100 qubit processor. I, I forgot to mention, but it took, so every time Google runs an algorithm on that computer, uh, the first time it took them two days just to tweak every single qubit of those 54 to make it work. And then every day they take eight hours to calibrate the computer before they can run an algorithm on it. Because none of the qubits are the same and there's process variation between them. So they have to tweak that first and foremost. So that's your quantum computer today. Yeah, it takes eight hours just to start up. And then it, uh, and, and, and the first time they do it, it's 24 hours and then they keep it there at 20 millikelvin continuously. If they change the temperature, then they have to start again. Very well, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Wanigescu, for coming. Uh, and for the audience, Professor Wanigescu will be also joining us uh, during the networking session. So if you do have any other questions, uh, please feel free to uh, go and ask him. I'm going to- I'll stop sharing. I think I managed to do that. I'm yes, sure. thank okay. you. Thank you very much. Um, so, we are going into our networking session right now um, and to just show you uh, briefly uh, what the structures are. Um, if you could take a look at your um, the, the bottom right of your screen, you see that there are options uh, for breakout rooms and you, you have the option to choose the breakout room that you wish to go to. And there are about 13 breakout rooms right now. So depending on who you wanna go and chat with, uh, if you have any questions from them, uh, please feel free to go there. Uh, we have some of our networking guests coming in also right now. Uh, we ask them to please uh, go ahead and go to the uh, assigned breakout room uh, that we have here on the screen. Uh, that would be amazing. And uh, with that, we also want to uh, thank you for uh, the rooms will be open for the next uh, 30 and uh, 30 to 40 uh, 30, 30 to 45 minutes. Um, we ask everybody to stay in. If they, uh, if you, they have any questions, just send us uh, send us your messages. Uh, you can feel free to, feel free to change between the rooms if you want to go to different rooms, ask different questions, come back, uh, ask another question. Feel free to do that. We will be showing uh, we will be sharing a survey with you guys after the event. Uh, we would really appreciate it if you could give us your feedback on how the event was. And thank you again so much for your support. I'm going to st stop screen sharing and have fun at the networking.